All right, title of the sermon this morning is Salvation by Grace. Salvation by Grace. So Christianity is simple, um, but sometimes defending the simple can be complex. So uh, I'm not spending so much time on what the gospel is, but I'm just talking about, you know, really clarifying sometimes the questions and the misconceptions about what it means uh, when we talk about salvation by grace. So salvation is very simple. You know, we are sinners. We deserve hell. We cannot earn our way to heaven. We cannot do any works. No works is required to get to heaven. We put our faith on the Lord Jesus Christ because of what Jesus did, right? His death, his burial, his resurrection. We put our faith on that. We're trusting that to get us to heaven, right? And once we do that, we call upon the Lord, we are saved eternally, right? There's no, I have to do this to keep my salvation. I don't have to try and live a good life in order to earn salvation. I don't have to, you know, get baptized, take communion, go to church, give to charity, try and cut the sin out of my life. These are all good things that we should do as Christians. But if anyone teaches that you have to do these in order to get saved, they are teaching a heresy, right? They are teaching that you have to work your way to heaven and work salvation is one of the worst heresies in Christianity. Why? Because if somebody believes that, they won't go to heaven, right? So the thing that they're hoping will get them to heaven will actually send them to hell because you need to trust Jesus Christ in order to get to heaven and not anything that you are doing. That's why this doctrine, salvation by grace, is so important. So whilst Christianity is simple, sometimes defending this concept can get com complex. And this is what I want to talk a bit about today. And, you know, I want you guys in our church, I want you to understand this doctrine extremely well. You know, sometimes when I go out soul winning, I knock on the door, a person says they're a Christian. It's like, oh, do you know why you're going to heaven? Or what, what do you think you did to get yourself to heaven? And they're like, oh, I can't really put it into words. I don't really know. You know, like, do you want to be like that as a Christian? You know, like, if you cannot articulate why you were saved, how you were saved, how you're going to, like, somebody else can get saved, you don't understand it well enough. You know what I mean? You need to get to the point where if somebody asks you, are you saved? How do you get saved? It should just roll off the tongue because it's just, it, it is a simple thing. Now, defending it may not be so simple when they say, well, what about this verse? What about that verse? What about this? You know, that can get complex. But you should know, yes, I'm saved. Why? Because I've put my faith on Jesus Christ. What did Jesus Christ do? He died on the cross, was buried and rose again. He died for my sins. How long are you saved? I'm saved forever. Why? Because Jesus paid for all my sins. You know, like that should just come naturally to the Christian that understands why they're saved, right? And you guys need to understand this uh, topic extremely well. Um, why? One, it's going to give you stability in your faith, right? Stability in your faith. So knowing why you're saved is not enough to give you stability. Why? Because instability comes from when people attack that faith, right? They attack that position with objections, misconceptions, and the more you know about it, the better equipped you are to, to, to defend it off, right? It's kind of like, well, that's why the Bible talks about the shield of faith. You know, you, you have this armor on and the different parts of God's armor that help you defend against, what, the fiery darts of the wicked. So one, it's going to give you stability in your faith. Number two, you will be able to clearly explain it to somebody else, right? And three, you're going to be able to defend it from false doctrine, from false teaching, right? So that's why it's very important you understand not just why you're saved, but also be able to defend it. And I think that's so important as well when we think about the next generation. Don't just teach children what to believe. You need to tell them why, and you need to help them know, hey, what are the potential objections people have and you need to explain it to that depth as well right obviously as they get older you know you'll be explaining it in more depth so a couple of things i want to talk about in this topic right first one is two ways to heaven are you a victor what are you talking about because i thought you just said there was one way to heaven well there are two ways to heaven right there's grace and then there's works the problem is that one of those ways to heaven is impossible right so, but that is one of the ways that somebody could get to heaven if it were possible. 
and it's one of the things in the Bible, but that's why the New Covenant exists. Now, the reason why that that's an important thing to know is this is why in the Bible you will see passages that allude to that other way of salvation, right? That, or that other way to get to heaven. But generally, Jesus talks about them to show that they're not possible, right? Galatians 2.16, knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but by the faith of Jesus Christ. Even we have believed in Jesus Christ, that we might be justified by the faith of Christ and not by the works of the law. For by the works of the law shall no flesh be justified. Right, so the two ways is grace and works. We know works is impossible. Works is something that you do. So if you think about what works is, it's like you do some work, it's like a merited reward, right? You do work for somebody, you get something in exchange for that work you do. So when it comes to salvation, works can be, well, if somebody says, well, you need to be baptized before you can go to heaven. You need to go to church before you go to heaven. You need to be more faithful before you go to heaven. You need to do X, Y, Z before you go to heaven. You know, you need to like confess your sins to somebody before you go to heaven. All these things that people get you to do to say in hope of eternal life other than Jesus Christ, this is works, right? Now, what is grace? What does the word grace mean, right? Grace means it's an unmerited favor, right? So it's something that somebody does for you that you do not deserve, right? That's why we say salvation is by grace because we're not deserving of salvation. We put our faith on Jesus Christ. It's something we didn't deserve. He did it out of his love for us. So we receive that grace, that salvation from God. It's his grace that saves us. It's not our own works. So those are the two options, right? And works, like we said, is impossible. Famous uh, passage in Ephesians 2. Make, this is the clearest verse in the Bible. It says, not by works. For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Now, the reason why I say it's important that you understand that there are these two ways to heaven, but one of them is impossible. This is the reason why, and this is why we looked at Luke 18, but we're going to go to Luke 10 first that we see Jesus referring to this method of salvation, right? But it's for the purpose of noting that it's impossible. And a lot of people will go to, you know, the rich young ruler, the Samaritan, you know, the good Samaritan, and they'll think, oh, see, Jesus is teaching this because this is how we get to heaven. But if you actually read the whole passage, he's actually teaching these things in response to people asking him about trying to get to heaven by good works and he's trying to show them that they haven't done that right so we'll look at these two things now is it a commendable way to live now don't get me wrong salvation by grace is not a doctrine talking about how you live as a christian and this is where people get mixed up right because they think salvation by grace but as christians shouldn't we be doing these things shouldn't we get baptized shouldn't we take communion shouldn't we go to church shouldn't we try and live a good life shouldn't we try and get all the sin out of our life shouldn't we repent of all our sins well yeah of course right that's what's expected of the christian but that's not what we do to get saved right salvation is not by works it's by grace and if we try and work our way to heaven we will come short right for all of sin come short of the glory of god Let's look here. This is the story. This is the parable of the Good Samaritan, right? And behold, a certain lawyer stood up and tempting him, saying, Master, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? He said unto them, What is written in the law? How readest thou? He answering said, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, and with all thy strength, and with all thy mind, and thy neighbor as thyself. And he said unto him, Thou hast answered right. This do, and thou shalt live. Now, if you just take that, you are, oh, is Jesus teaching work salvation here? Well, in a sense, yeah, he, he is. He's saying, like, look, if you could do all that, you would go to heaven. Now, the problem is, it's impossible. The lawyer knows it's impossible too. Jesus knows it's impossible too. But Jesus is just saying this to highlight the fact that this lawyer is trying to justify himself by works, right? And this is why in verse 29, it says, but he, willing to justify himself, right? He's trying to say, oh, okay. He says, said unto Jesus, who is my neighbor? So he's saying, Jesus is saying, hey, you have to love your neighbor as yourself. That's one of the commandments to keep. And now he's saying, yeah, but, but who is my neighbor? Like, you know, I have loved my neighbor, but, you know, let's, let's get a bit more specific to see if I've done this. 
And now we go into the parable of the Good Samaritan. Jesus answering said, A certain man went down from Jerusalem to Jericho and fell among thieves which stripped him of his raiment and wounded him and departed, leaving him half dead. And by chance there came down a certain priest that way. And when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. So this parable is, is trying to get the lawyer to reflect that, you know, look at these, these, these supposedly godly people are like avoiding this, this Samaritan that has uh, befallen some unfortunate events. And likewise, a Levite, when he was at the place, so you remember the priests were descended from Aaron, Levites were of the Levitical tribe, right? They were the sons of Levi, but not all of them were priests, right? Priests were descended from Aaron, and Aaron was a Levite, right? He was Moses' uh, brother. Likewise, a Levite, when he was at the place, came and looked on him, passed by on the other side, right? So it's kind of like what people do today. If they're walking down the path, they don't want to run inside, they cross over the other way, right? But a certain Samaritan, as he journeyed, came where he was, and when, and when he saw him, he had compassion on him. So obviously the Jews didn't like the Samaritans because they were kind of intermingled amongst the Gentiles. You know, they were, the, I think, the, the northern tribe of Israel. Um, and then the southern was Judah. That's why they called the Jews. And went to him, bound up his wounds, pouring in oil and wine, and set him on his own beast and brought him to an inn, took care of him. And on the morrow, when he departed, he took out two pence and gave them to the host and said unto him, Take care of him, and whatsoever thou spendest more, when I come again, I will pay thee. Which now of these three, thinkest thou, was neighbour unto him that fell among the thieves? So it's interesting that Jesus spins that question on him. It's not about who is your neighbour, it's about being a neighbour to somebody, right? Because he's saying, which of these three was neighbour unto him? Isn't that interesting? And he said, he that showed mercy on him. Then said Jesus unto him, Go, and do thou likewise. So, so nobody's arguing that this is a commendable way to live. Obviously, good works are called good works for a reason. They're not called bad works, right? So they're good works for a reason. But is Jesus teaching here that this is what you have to do to go to heaven? Notice he's brought up this method of salvation to highlight to the lawyer, you have not fulfilled this method of salvation and this is why you need grace, right? This is what happens as well to the rich young ruler, Luke 18. A certain ruler asked him, saying, Good master, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? Jesus said unto him, Why callest thou me good? None is good, save one that is God. Now I think Jesus responds this way for two reasons. One is, he's saying to the rich young ruler, Do you realize that you are acknowledging me as God if you call me good master? And the second thing is, He's, he's, he's starting to say to this rich young ruler that nobody is good enough. Nobody's good except God. Right? So there is none good, like we read in Romans 3. Thou knowest the commandments. Do not commit adultery. Do not kill. Do not steal. Do not bear false witness. Honour thy father and thy mother. And some people believe that Jesus intentionally left out, do not covet, right? Don't covet your neighbour's wife and maid, servant, man, servant, ox, and all that, because that was the one, obviously, that he was not keeping. He said, all these things have I kept from my youth up. So notice these people that come to Jesus, you see how they're trying to justify themselves by works? So Jesus is not saying, yeah, you get to heaven by works. He's saying, yeah, if you want to get to heaven by works, keep it all. You're not, right? That's what he's trying to reveal to these people. Now, when Jesus heard these things, he said unto him, Yet lackest thou one thing. And I think Jesus is being quite gracious here, because I think if he's honest with all of us, we don't just lack one thing. I mean, we lack a multitude of things, right? Yet thou lackest one thing. Sell all that thou hast, and distribute unto the poor, and thou shalt have treasure in heaven. Come and follow me. And when he heard this, he was very sorrowful, for he was very rich. And when Jesus thought that he was very sorrowful, he said, How hardly shall they that have riches enter into the kingdom of God? For it is easier for a camel to go through a needle's eye than for a rich man to enter into the kingdom of God. Now, we don't, if we compare this to Mark, and I don't have this, Mark says, How hardly shall they that trust in riches enter into the kingdom of God? So it's not, Jesus is not teaching here that just because people have riches, it's hard for them to, to enter into the kingdom of God. It's generally people that have riches and are more prosperous 
tend to trust more in themselves and on their riches than in God, right? Usually poor people that are poor or struggle, they tend to look to God more for help. So they naturally are a bit more humble and will believe on God more so than a rich man. That's what he's going on about, right? And they heard it and said, who then can be saved? Right? So you see how they're thinking, hey, if you have to work, it's so hard for a rich person to get into heaven. Who then can be saved? And he said, the things which are impossible with man are possible with God. So you see how it's very clear that these scenarios where Jesus is alluding to the old covenant, which is, is a covenant of works, which is not something that we can keep, which is why the covenant of grace was fulfilled by Jesus Christ. It's impossible for people to keep the law in order to be saved. So with, with, with um, the things which are impossible with men, which is what? Earning your own salvation are possible with God. Why? Because he was going to provide salvation by grace. Right? Let's go on to point two. So we have grace and we have works. Right? And the important thing for you to understand is that these two things cannot come together and still be grace. Right? Grace and works cannot be mixed and you still be left with grace. Right? An analogy can be, hey, something, that, something cannot both be free and paid for by the same person. Because once you pay for it, it's no longer free. The only reason why it's free for you is because somebody else has paid for it. And this is how salvation works. Why is salvation free for us? Because Jesus paid for it, right? He took on the sin. He died on the cross. He went to hell for three days and three nights. He rose again. That's the reason why it's free for us. So yeah, people can say, yeah, salvation isn't free. Something had to pay for it. It's only free for us because somebody else has paid for it, right? Now you can't put these things together. You can't say something is free and also charge for it. And likewise, salvation can't be free if we have to do even one work for it. Right? So it's like, I, it's like we will say when we give the gospel. We say, hey, if I give you something, even if I charged you like 10 cents, that might be cheap, but that's not free. See, salvation's not cheap. Salvation's free. Right? Romans 11.6 And if by grace, then it is no more of works. Otherwise, grace is no more grace. But if it be of works, then it is no more grace. Otherwise, work is no more work. Now, you often hear people say, oh, you know, but I've got to do my part for salvation, right? Now, if somebody's talking about doing their part because they're grateful for salvation, that's fine, right? But if people, some people believe Jesus does most of it, but I've just got to do, like, my bit just to, like, get me over the line, right? Now, that may sound like a reasonable, pro reasonable proposition in the sense that, well, if Jesus does 99.99999%, you know, kind of like the death rate with COVID, and I have to do just like 001%, you say, hey, that's like reasonable. You know, it's not much. I'm not asking much. Just do that little bit. You know, the question is not whether it's a reasonable proposition. The question is, is that even an option? You see, like the, the problem is, it's not that it's not reasonable and people think it's reasonable. The problem is it's not an option because your only options are either grace or works, right? And if, if you have to do it by works, then you have to do all of it. That's the problem, right? This is what Galatians 5, 2 says. Behold, I, Paul, say unto you. So what was happening in the Galatian church context? They're trying to creep in saying, hey, you've got to get circumcised to be saved. Right? They're adding this work to salvation. And this is how Paul responds. He's writing this letter. This is the one letter he writes himself. A lot of letters he just spoke, other people wrote it for him. But in Galatians, he's dealing with the topic of work salvation, and he says, you see how large a letter I've written with my own hand, right? Behold, I, Paul, say unto you, that if ye be circumcised, Christ shall profit you nothing. Now let's say you have the mindset that, oh, I just got to do my little bit, oh, I just got to cut this little bit of skin off, you know, and then I'll, I'll get to heaven. But he's saying, look, Christ shall profit you nothing. Why is that? Even if they had to do that one work, it's because, he says, I testify again to every man that is circumcised that he is a debtor to do the whole law. Christ is become of no effect unto you. Whosoever you are justified by the law, you have fallen from grace. So you see how grace is an option for you. But if you decide, hey, I'm going to try to keep the law in order to get to heaven, then Paul is saying, then you must keep it all. That's the option you're choosing because you are no longer choosing the option of grace, right? Because you can't mix grace and works. 
So keep that in mind. It's not about, is it reasonable? You know, maybe if God said you just need to do X, Y, Z, hey, that would be a reasonable proposition to go, oh, I just have to do this, I just have to get wet, get baptized, to eat a bit of bread, drink a bit of juice, you know, and that's all I have to do, I'm saved, you know. That's reasonable, but that's not an option. That's the problem. Your options are either works and you do them all, or it's by grace, okay? So that's an important point there. You cannot mix the two. Faith alone or grace alone. Some people get confused with this, right? And I think this is an important topic to kind of clarify. Is salvation, when we say it's by faith alone and we say it's by grace alone, which one is it, right? Is it by grace alone or is it by faith alone? Well, let's go back to Ephesians 2. It says, For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Notice how it's phrased here, and I like how God phrases it here. It's by grace through faith. So how does this work mechanically, right, in terms of if you were to think about it? Grace is what saves you. That's why the two options are you're either saved by grace or you're saved by your own works. But how does a person receive that grace, right? The way you receive that grace, because you can't see eternal life, right? You can't, it's can't, you can't touch it. It's not like given to you in a package and you open it and it's like apply it to yourself. Salvation is something that is spiritual, right? So you can't see it. So how do you receive it? You receive it through faith. You're saying, I, I, when I believe and I call upon the Lord, that's an act of faith that is allowing you to then receive that grace. So when we say salvation is by grace alone, that's absolutely right. When we say salvation is by faith alone, we're saying the only thing that must be done in order to receive that grace is faith. Why? Because you have some religions that teach, and the Catholics and the Orthodox are a good example, where they teach in order to receive that grace, you must do a work. Right? So they'll say the sacraments are the means by which you receive that grace. So yeah, they say you're saved by grace, but how do you get that grace? Well, you've got to confess. You've got to go to church. You've got to go to communion. You've got to like, get baptized. There are these things you have to do, and these are the things. They don't call them works. Right? They say, well, they're not works, they're just the things that you do in order to get salvation. But see, the only other option to receiving it by faith is receiving it by works. Right? You have to do something in order to get it. Right? So even though they don't call them works, they are works. Right? They are things that you must obey God to do in order to get it. And that is work salvation. So we don't believe work salvation. Salvation is by grace. Right? So we have... That's why we say salvation is by faith alone. We're emphasizing the point that faith is all that's required to receive this grace. Now, faith is, is not... The, 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 this is where the confusion is, right? Because even though we say salvation is by faith alone, faith is not only used when it comes to salvation, right? So faith is when you believe something, right? That is the way you receive salvation. You just believe on the Lord Jesus Christ to be saved. But that's not the only place where your faith is exercised. Why? Because works are also done by faith. And this is why people get confused, because when they say salvation's by faith, they think, yeah, but faith includes living by faith, doing the right thing. I do these works by faith. But that's not what we're talking about when we're talking about the topic of salvation. Right? The topic of salvation is you're just receiving grace by faith. You're not doing works by faith in order to get salvation by grace. Okay? So just... It's, a good, it's an important distinction there, and sometimes people get mixed up on it. Let me show you a couple of verses in terms of we do works by faith as well. Right? Colossians 2.6 As ye have therefore received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk ye in him. So you see the two aspects there? You've received Jesus Christ by faith, right? That's salvation. And just like you believed to receive the grace, now believe the commandments that you're going to keep and do the works, right? To live the way you ought to live. Not for salvation. This is just an exhortation to live right, right? Rooted and built out in him and established in the faith as you have been taught, abounding therein with thanksgiving. So notice there, when you're established in the faith, the faith, you know, when we talk about our, uh, you know, like a church has like a statement of faith. We have our beliefs on the website, 
You know, the beliefs on the website are not only about how to get saved. We have, we have beliefs about you know, abortion, we have beliefs about end times, we have beliefs about you know, communion. and things. So you see how our faith includes the things we believe as a Christian. But don't get confused when we say salvation's by faith. We're not saying you've got to do all these things to get saved. We're saying faith is the way you receive salvation. Right? That's um, just by belief. But we believe other things. Establishing the faith. 2 Corinthians 5. Therefore we are always confident, knowing that whilst we are at home in the body, we are absent from the Lord. For we walk by faith, not by sight. So you notice that we walk by faith. Romans 1. For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. For it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. For therein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith. As it is written, the just shall live by faith. So notice, faith on Christ is salvation. But we go from faith to faith, right? Because we start from the faith of salvation, which is believing on Jesus Christ, and then we should be moving on to, as we grow as saved believers, once saved, always saved believers, we grow as we start walking by faith. Why? Because we need to believe the Bible, the commandments that we read. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God, and we ought to do the things that we learn, right? We ought to do the things that we hear. That's why we live by faith. Hebrews 11, by faith Enoch was translated that he should not see death and was not found because God had translated him. For before his translation, he had this testimony that he pleased God. But without faith, it is impossible to please him. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. Now the Mormons have a belief where they think, um, like if you were to sort of pin them down on it, and they say, yeah, yeah, you get grace when you're saved. When you believe on Jesus, you get grace. But they believe um, this grace that God gives you then, it, then enables you to work for salvation. So it's like you couldn't earn salvation on your own, but you need to put faith on Jesus. You're then given this grace, and then this grace then allows you to live the right life so that you can earn salvation. I mean, I don't know how they reason this in their mind but that's that's what they believe if you were to actually pin them down on it and ask them so just beware when you hear people say yeah it's just faith on jesus right it's just salvation by grace because you need to find out what they mean by it don't just assume that if somebody says salvation by grace oh they're saved because you know what a jehovah's witness will tell you that as well like an orthodox person will tell you hey you got to believe on jesus christ but what i've found talking to ex-orthodox and orthodox people when they say believe you know what they mean they're mixing up this faith thing that i'm talking about they think believe on jesus means i'm willing to follow him i'm willing to obey him i'm willing to submit to his will that's work salvation so this is why i'm trying to drill this point home the difference between by grace through faith by faith alone but we also do works by faith but that's not what we're referring to when we're talking about salvation now just on this topic of faith right people will ask the question salvations by by faith i receive grace through faith and they say well what if i stop believing you know they say well, what if i stop believing am i still saved because i'm saved by faith so this is another reason why i think the statement we're saved by faith alone can be confusing because people think what's saving them is the state of their faith and they think i have to have a state of faith because remember your faith is like this you know, hopefully it's like this, but sometimes it's like this, you know, and whatever, you know. So you, you got to, your faith is up and down. And sometimes your faith is stronger, sometimes your faith is weaker. Your salvation is not based on the state of your faith. So it's not like you have a state of faith and I have to maintain this state of faith and only while I maintain this state of faith am I saved. The grace is what saved you, right? And you had to receive the grace through faith. Now, it's a one-time event. That moment you exercise the faith on Jesus Christ, you've received the grace. Grace is received through faith. You now have it. You can't lose it, even if your faith is up and down, even if it's not existent one day. Right? So this is why it's not, it's not dependent on you. Right? It's not dependent on how much you believe in God. It was dependent on did you receive by faith one time in your life that grace once you open the door to that grace, you have it eternally. It's a one-way street. That's how I explain it to people. You, it's like the ark 
in Noah's day. You get on the ark, now you're shut in. Right? You, can't, you couldn't leave even if you wanted to because the Lord shut them in. Right? So same with salvation. Once you open your heart right, to that grace, you believe, it's done. Now you're a child of God. Now even if you forsake God, God says, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. You see how it works? Same with your children. It's like once they're born into your family, your love for them is greater than their love for you. It's the same analogy right, that Jesus used. So what if I stop believing? Your faith in the Christian life can fluctuate. But remember, salvation is an event. It's when you call upon the Lord in faith. Look at what the Bible says here in 2 Timothy 2, verse 11. It is a faithful saying, for if we be dead with him, we shall also live with him. Right? So that's salvation. We believe on him spiritually. We die with him. We will rise again. Verse 12. If we suffer, we shall also reign with him. If we deny him, he also will deny us. So some people try and use this verse to show, hey, if, you're, if you don't confess Jesus openly and risk life and everything, then you're going to lose salvation, which is not what that's saying, right? That's just saying something's going to be denied. Well, what is it, right? And I believe what's being denied here is rewards will be denied to you. So yes, you will lose rewards in heaven if you do not take a stand for Jesus, even in the face of death, right? But notice who is being denied here. He will also deny us. So see our request from us is being denied. If we believe not, this is the point I'm making right now, if we believe not, yet he abideth faithful, he cannot deny himself. Now why is that relevant to salvation? Because salvation is not a promise to you. It's, it's not, it, salvation is not a promise you're making to God. Sorry, Salvation is a promise God makes to you. So that's why once you've accepted that promise, you're saved forever. If you were to ever not be saved, that would be God denying himself. That's why the Bible says, hey, even if you are not faithful, God will not break his promise. Right? That's what, is, what it's saying here. So, hey, even if you stop believing, if we believe not, yet he abideth faithful. And the key to unlock the logical flaw is we're not saved by our, the state of our faith. A moment of faith is what was required to receive the grace. But why do we stay saved? The grace of God. It's the grace of God that got me saved. It's the grace of God that keeps me saved. It's the grace of God is the reason why I'll never not be saved from that point onwards. Right? I never earned it. I can't lose it. This is a small point, but some, uh, and maybe you guys haven't thought of this, and maybe this is just me going in too deep, but I have come across this question where people ask, is there a difference between believing in in the Bible or when the Bible says believe on. Now, I think this is just vocabulary. I think these mean the same thing. I don't think there's a difference between believing in the Lord Jesus, believing on the Lord Jesus. Right? Some people have said in, in John 3, 16, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him, they'll say, should not perish. Like, you know, you shouldn't, but you may, because you may, you haven't believed on him. You believe, you believe, you've only believed in him, but have everlasting life. Now, I don't think, I think that that distinction doesn't exist because I think should and shall is the same thing. It's a definite, you will, you will not perish, right? And why do I say that? Look at John 11. Jesus said unto her, I am the resurrection and the life. He that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. And whosoever liveth and believeth in me shall never die. So it's not should, there's shall. So that's, people say that's more definite. I think they're just as definite. Believest thou this? And then here we go to believeth on me, John, John 12, 46. I am come a light into the world that whosoever believeth on me should not abide in darkness. But then John 6, 35, Jesus said unto them, I am the bread of life. He that cometh to me shall never hunger, and he that believeth on me shall never thirst. So I just think there's no distinction between in, on, should, shall. I think it's making the same statement there. So I don't know if you've come across that before, but don't, don't, don't get phased by that. Number five is calling upon the Lord. Now, this has been one uh, issue that's been a bit contentious in independent Baptist circles, and maybe you guys have never thought of these, but I'm just bringing these arguments to your attention, right? The question is, does a person need to call upon the Lord to be saved? Now, what does that mean? Does, 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 do you need to talk to Jesus in order to receive salvation, right? 
Now we're not talking about whether this is audible or not, because obviously you don't have to pray audibly. It's not that you have to pray in a certain position. You know, it's just the question is, is there an acknowledgement to Jesus? Right? Is there a calling to Jesus to say, Jesus, yes, I believe, I believe you. Yes, I want you as my saviour. Jesus, save me. Right? Now, I believe it is required. Right? I, I believe that there is always a moment that that is the act of believing on Jesus. I don't believe that somebody just believing that Jesus is able to save you is the point of salvation. I think that there is a point where somebody goes, yes, he's able to save me, and then they go, Jesus, save me. That's the point that they're saying. Now, it might be splitting hairs because I, I guarantee you that everyone who believes that Jesus is the only saviour and he's able to save them will, will likely acknowledge to Jesus that he is, I mean, it's, it's a bit weird that you believe there's a God in heaven, you believe that God in heaven can save you, you believe that God in heaven obviously hears your prayers, you believe that that God can save you, and yet you never once acknowledge his existence and go, yes, please save me. So I think it's a bit of a mute argument in the sense that people are trying to split hairs here because you will call out to God in some fashion once you believe on him, right? But why is it important? There are people that believe that if you say you must call upon the Lord to be saved, they'll say, hey, you're teaching work salvation, right? Because they say calling upon the Lord, you're getting them to do a work, right, in order to be saved. And this is the reason why I'm bringing up this point. I want you to know that just because we say, yeah, you, you have to call upon the name of the Lord to be saved, that that's not works, right? Now, in Romans 10... We have the clear progression of salvation, right? For there is no difference between the Jew and the Greek, for the same Lord, Lord over all is rich unto all that call upon him. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. How then shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? So you see, I think those things kind of happen simultaneously, but it's saying here, well, obviously you're only going to call upon the name of the Lord once you believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, right? Once you believe what is being said about him, the report. How shall they believe in him in whom they have not heard, and how shall they hear without a preacher? How shall they preach except they be sent, as it is written? How beautiful are the feet of them that preach the gospel of peace and bring glad tidings of good things. So you see the progression there is people are sent to preach the gospel, right? And Jesus has sent all of us to go preach the gospel. And he says people hear from that preaching, then they believe that preaching, then they call upon the name of the Lord to be saved. Now, what we don't want to promote is if people just acknowledge but they don't call upon the name of the Lord, I mean, even though it's unlikely, I don't think somebody's past the point of salvation yet. It's like if you had to walk through a door, right? And they say, yes, that walking through that door is going to save me, and if I walk through that door, I will be saved, but they haven't technically walked through the door yet. And that's what I think it's like with salvation. You may go, yeah, I believe Jesus is a historical figure, yeah, I believe he's God in the flesh. I believe he died on the cross, even for my sins. But the moment you go, Jesus, I'm trusting you for my salvation. That's the point of salvation. That's what, I, that's what I believe the Bible is teaching us here. Now, what about this accusation where people say, ah, but if you require people to ask, that's more than believing. That's work salvation. And like I said, I believe calling upon the name of the Lord is how you actually believe on Jesus. That's the act of believing on the Lord Jesus Christ. When you acknowledge him, right, and you call upon him to be saved. But here's a couple of verses just to show you that just asking for something does not make it works. If you ask for something, it's still a gift. And we would know that in our day-to-day -day life. Like if you ask somebody, let's say like somebody goes, hey, I'll give you a million dollars. And you go, all you have to do is ask for it. And you go, hey, can I have the million dollars? They give it to you. Can you claim, like, ah, oh, look at all the work I did to do this. Like, it's not a gift from you. I earned it, buddy, by asking it from you. You know? That's not, that's not how it works. Look at what Jesus says in Matthew 7. Ask, and it shall be given you. Seek, and ye shall find. Knock, and it shall be opened unto you. For every one that asketh receiveth, and he that seeketh findeth. And to him that knocketh it shall be opened. Or what man is there of you, whom if his son ask bread, will he give him a stone? 
Or if he ask a fish, will he give him a servant? Notice the asking here. So the receiving is only being, it's only being given because it's being asked. If ye then, being evil, know how to give good gifts unto your children, how much more shall your Father which is in heaven give good things to them that ask him? So notice that just because you ask the Lord to be saved, that doesn't make it work. So you're just asking for the gift that he's offering you. Just like here, because he's likening salvation, obviously, to getting good gifts. And he's calling it still here that you give good gifts to your children. Right? The gift of God, Romans 6.23, is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. If we call upon the Lord for that gift, we're not working for that gift. You know, we're just asking for it. John 4, even Jesus to the woman at the well. Now Jacob's well was there. Jesus, therefore, being wearied with his journey, sat thus on the well, and it was about the sixth hour. There cometh a woman of Samaria to draw water. Jesus saith unto her, Give me to drink. For his disciples were gone away unto the city to buy meat. Then saith the woman of Samaria unto him, How is it that thou, being a Jew, asketh drink of me, which am a woman of Samaria? For the Jews have no dealing with, with the Samaritans. Jesus answered and said unto her, If thou knewest the gift of God, and who it is that saith to thee, Give me to drink, thou wouldest have asked of him, and he would have given thee living water. So you see there how he said, If you know the gift of God and you knew who I was, you would ask me for it, and I would give you this gift. So he said, Notice just because asking for a gift doesn't make it a gift, uh, doesn't make it works. It right? doesn't mean that you've earned it. All right, two more points so you know where I'm at. A license to sin. A license to sin. Now, some people, when they hear salvation by grace, they hear this taught and they realize, hey, well, if you believe on Jesus and you're saved eternally, doesn't that mean that you're, aren't you teaching people that they can just do whatever they want? Now, do, does anyone here think that that's my position? Does my, is my position, hey, yeah, you guys just do whatever you want. Just live however you want. You know, just, of course not, right? So, but why do people think that? The reason why people think this is because work salvation is so ingrained in them that they have not yet comprehended that I don't need to work my way to heaven. So when they, they're struggling with the concept of it's free, but how can I live however I want and still deserve to go to heaven? It's because we don't deserve to go to heaven. We don't get to heaven by how good we are. We get to heaven because of grace, because of God's goodness to us. So that you've got to recognize when people are struggling with this concept, that's, that I think that's what they're struggling with. They're struggling still. They're still hanging on to this idea that I have to somehow earn my way to heaven. And they still haven't fully departed from it. So when you say, hey, even if you live however you want, you'd still go to heaven. They're like, whoa, that's just like, it's too much. Right? Because it's like, no, you know, you have to live a certain way. How can you still go to heaven? How can that murderer still go to heaven? How can this person still... How can if you commit suicide? How can you still go to heaven? Because they still have not fully relinquished that thought that salvation is not of you. It's of Jesus. And what that means is, yeah, even if you received grace and you lived however you wanted, you would still be saved. Think of the analogy that Jesus uses being born again. A parent and a child. If you were to tell your children, they will always be your children, even if they are naughty. Are you saying to them, it's okay for them to be naughty? No, right? You, if you say to a child, you know, you, you're always my child, no matter, even if you're a naughty child, and all of them are naughty, right? I mean, you know, that, you know that, that's not going to make the child think, oh, my, my parents think I can just do whatever I want. You know, <laughs> they're going to realize, no, that just means my actions is not changing my relationship status with you. But my parents still want me to be a good child. That's the same with salvation. Right? Salvation is not saying, therefore, it's okay to live however you want. It just means God doesn't deal with you like an unbeliever. See, an unbeliever is standing before God like a judge. It's like you've, you, you, you're a criminal standing before a judge, and you've committed a crime worthy of the capital punishment, that's sin, right? God, the judge has no relationship with this criminal, right? You've sinned against the law, now you're going to pay for it. When you believe on Jesus Christ, Christ is now that criminal standing in your place, and he was condemned in your place before the judge. 
You are now a child of God. So you're a child of that judge. Right? And the judge is now dealing with you as a son, as a daughter, not as a criminal in his courtroom. Jesus is the criminal in the courtroom for you. You see, so the relationship has changed. That's why hell is no longer in the picture, because Jesus went to hell for you. That's how salvation works. And this concept is alluded to in Romans. Romans 5.20, Moreover, the law entered that the offence might abound, but where sin abounded, grace did much more abound. So what is that saying? No matter how much you sin, grace will always be more than the sin that you can commit. Right? Why? Because Jesus died for all sins, past, present, and future. But in Romans 6, he says, What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? So he's saying, is the right thing to do, knowing that grace will abound greater than our sin, to then just keep on sinning? Now, if you did that, if you did the wrong thing, would grace continue to abound? Yes. That's what he says in Romans 5. But where sin abounded, grace did much more abound. But Romans 6 is saying, therefore, should you live that way? Is that the right way to live? No. Just like the child knowing that he's always the child, even if he's naughty. That's not saying the child should be naughty. Right? That's saying actually the child knowing that should strive to show some love for his parents and live right. That's what it's saying here. Shall we continue in sin that grace may be about? God forbid. How shall we that a did dead to sin live any longer therein? Right? Now what if I told my children, going back to the children analogy, what if I told my children they would only remain my children if they obeyed my rules. You'd say like, that's, the, that's, I mean, that's, that's not even true. Exactly. So, so why do Christians do that? Why do you hear Christians saying, oh yeah, well you don't live this way, you may not be saved. Yeah, that may, cha you know, that may change my child's behavior. Like if I say, you know what, if you're naughty, you may not even stay my child. You know? That may go, oh, you know, they want to stay the child, so then they live, they live differently. You say, I'm lying to them. It's the same with salvation. When people think, hey, you know, you need to keep on doing works, otherwise you won't stay a child of God, that, that may motivate people to do good works, but for the wrong reason. Right? That's why that's, that's, a, that's the wrong way to go about it. But that's why sometimes it's preached that way, because it, it could be a good motivator. I mean, it's motivating all the false religions out there. That's the reason why they want to shave their head and live in the mountains and beat themselves to his other stuff. I mean, that motivation is there to, so they won't go to hell. And sometimes that works to our detriment because, you know, yeah, you may not be as motivated as a person that's trying to save themselves from eternal damnation. We take grace for granted and we shouldn't. To whom much is given, much shall be required. We are given a lot. You know, we take it for granted. And, and sometimes we have a, the sinful thought that, hey, I'm saved anyway, right? Let somebody else do it. But we shouldn't have that thought. Right? We need to, we should be, the love should compel us to do good. So the last thing I want to talk about is, you know, finish up reasons to do good works. You say, well, you say, Victor, but if I'm going to heaven no matter what, they will say, like, well, what's the point? What's the point of even doing good works? Now, I've had so many people say this to me, and reflecting on it, I just think, now that I think about it, it is such a self-centered outlook on good works, isn't it? Because are you saying that the only reason why you're doing good works is for your own self-preservation? Is that, is that the, is that, you can't think of it, so you can't think of any good reason to do good works besides saving your own skin. You know what I mean? But people will say, they'll say like, well, I'm going to heaven anyway. What's the point? Well, of course there's a point, there's plenty of reasons. So let's just, I'll just mention them, right? But I'm not going to any verses. Here's some reasons for Christians to do good works, you know, that is not because you're going to go to hell if you don't, because that would be work salvation, right? Reason number one. Reason number one is a love for God. You know, and this should be the greatest reason why you do good works, because you recognize what you have been saved from. You are appreciative of what God has done for you and does for you and will do for you, and you think, you know what? It's reasonable that I give my life to him because he gave his life for me. 
Now, I don't need to do that to be saved, but that is a good motivation for why you want to do good works because you just love God and you love what God does for you. In spite of you being a wretched sinner, unworthy of his love, you know, we spit in his face in the way we live, and yet he loves us anyway. You know, and the more we reflect on that, the more you should abound in love towards God when you realize how good he's been to you. Num that's number one. Number two is a love for others. Where, you know, if you live a sinful life and you live a selfish, self-centered life, you will not be doing what's right by others. Think about the man that commits adultery with his receptionist or his admin person or whatever, and he destroys his family, destroys the upbringing of his children. I mean, there's now there's conflict without the within the family. I mean, many of you come from broken families, and maybe not for that particular reason, but you know the devastation that happens in a family when it breaks up. And, you know, a love for others. You know, that's why I think the Bible, you know, talks about women being saved in childbearing, saved from doing wrong because it keeps them back on the you know on the on the right path right where they start considering the love of, for their children and that and then it makes them you know like the bible talks about not be a you know tattler and a busybody and all that sort of stuff a love for others number three is you know a love for yourself so we talked about self-preservation but at the same time you know if people that you know, the Bible talks about, you know, if you're a servant to sin, you know, if you sin, you're a servant to sin. And that often happens in your own life. If you take on bad habits, I mean, that's not good for you. Do you know what I mean? Like, there, there's a lot of uh, good things that God wants us to enjoy, and we'll only enjoy them if we live the life that he has intended for us. You know, like, people think, oh, you know, you want to have fun and go out and party and take drugs and get drunk and then you see the people, what's the end of that life? The end of the life is just somebody's wasted their life doing all this useless stuff. I mean, even, you know, people, sometimes they, you know, they think about, oh, you know, but, you know, being married to one person, isn't that boring and blah, blah, blah. Yeah, well, if you look at the people that go out and they fornicate and they just sleep with anyone, you know what happens at the end? They feel like empty because you can't get the, the loyalty and the commitment and the things that you enjoy having the marriage that God intended you to have. So that's why it's a bit of that carrot that, that, that is dangled in front of you for people to go chase that sort of worldly lifestyle. And at the end of it, you just feel empty. Why? Because there's, there's no love there. There's no love in that sort of relationship. And you know, nothing compares to the love that God intends you to experience by living the way uh, God wants you to live. So love for yourself. So there's benefits for yourself as well. Right? What about some more negative ones? Number four is chastisement from God. Now this is different to hell. Remember we talked about the analogy of the judge and the criminal, right? That's punishment, right? That's capital punishment. But when we talk about corporal punishment, when we talk about you know, children getting disciplined, yeah, that, that is between a parent and a child. And you know, God spanks his children. Just like you know, we spank our children when they're misbehaving and they sometimes need some correction god does the same but you know what it's not a, it's not a physical rod that just gets smacked on your behind i don't know how god smacks his rod and you know you don't necessarily want to find out so we are children of god if we believed on jesus christ god is a good father just like if you're a good father you discipline your children god's a good father so whilst our motivation may not be, oh, I'm going to go to hell, it may be, you know, God can make my life difficult and I don't want him to. I bet that should be some motivation for me to, to do what's right, right? It's just like he made David's life difficult. He made he, other people in the Bible who have disobeyed him. He's made it difficult, but he has grace, you know, just like a good father has. Number five, you've got earthly consequences. So what do I mean by that? That, you know, obviously if somebody commits murder, you know, there, there's, if, if you commit a crime, there's government involved. You know, if you are like, you know, even church serves as a bit of social stigma for people that are not living right. You know what I mean? So these things are there and they're a good thing, right? This is how accountability works, right? You plug yourself into a church. Yes, you get the connections, you get the, the fellowship. But don't forget, part of the reason why it's good to be plugged into a church and know people so that one day when you go missing, people know you're missing. So, hey, where, where are you? Hey, get back to church. Get back in it. And like, oh, you know, I'm out of church and now, like, you know, everyone's bugging me and everything. Well, that's 
part of it. Part of it is when you step off the good path that God's people are there to try and encourage you to get back. You know, obviously we try and do it in a loving way and, you know, some people don't, don't always do it the right way. But this is part of the, these earthly consequences. There are just things that happen in life and you might want to avoid them. That's one, another good reason to do the right thing. And the last one is eternal rewards. Eternal rewards. So that is a good motivator. Right? There's nothing wrong with thinking, you know, I want to make a good investment with my life. We all like good investments. We all like thinking, hey, if I'm going to put my time and effort into something, I want to get a good return for that. I want to be efficient with my time and with my resources. So there's nothing wrong with knowing God will reward you. You know, I don't, I don't think that there's anything wrong with that, that God is saying, hey, you will be rewarded for the work you do for God. Why? Because God is a good master. And if you work hard for him, there will be the ultimate payday, which will be in heaven, right? Where you will have authority over people. You may have other things that people don't, not everyone's equal in heaven, right? But the way you live your life here is going to determine what sort of eternity that you will experience, right? And for those that have put more time and effort into God's kingdom, the more they'll be rewarded, right? And we're not all on the same scale, right? So to whom much is given, much shall be required. You may have less time, less resources. You're not going to be expected to do as much as the person that has more time and more resources, right? But there will be a day of reckoning, right? Those who aren't saved, are going to go to the lake of fire. But those of us who are saved, our works are going to be tried. And then whatever's left, that's pretty much where our standing is going to be for all of eternity. All right, that's all I have for you today. I hope that sermon cleared up a lot for you. I hope the way I explained it for you is very clear. I hope that gives you a more stable foundation for your faith. Listen back to this sermon again, ask questions. But make sure you understand salvation crystal clear okay it's the most important doctrine in christianity it's the most attacked as well don't get caught up with work salvation and make sure you know you're a good witness for jesus christ you know so if you know it you're going to be more effective when you have that conversation with your loved one your colleague or with that stranger all right let's pray thank you lord for your word we thank you for the lord jesus christ through him we know we have eternal life. We thank you for that assurance. We thank you that salvation is by grace. And we thank you that, Lord, we, we cannot earn our way to salvation. We thank you that through Jesus Christ, we can know we're saved. Thank you, Lord, for the love you show us. We are sinners. We sin against you every day. And uh, we thank you, Lord, that salvation is not dependent on the way we live. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.